Welcome back to Work Woman. It is an honor because today I have with me Sharon Lecter. Sharon has been such an influence on Brandon. I don't know if you guys know this, but Sharon actually was hired by Brandon. How many years ago was that? 10? Mm, probably, yeah, eight to 10 years ago. Eight to 10 years ago because of the work that you've done. And the I, I was introduced to Sharon through Brandon, through these videos. And, and my first job at Audigy Group was going through his leadership videos and cutting pieces out so he could use it. So that was my first introduction to you. And it is an honor because you are so impactful and influential to hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people. So we're gonna get to talk about some new projects that you're working on and go through something that has re very recently changed my life, which is Think and Grow Rich for Women. So Sharon, it is a complete pleasure. Well, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be with you. I just love, you. you're such a delight and I appreciate being here. Thank you. So, well, you, you told the story actually, and I'd love to have you tell the story because we were at a conference just three weeks ago when you were sharing about how you got into this space. Mm -hmm. Could you give the audience an intro into that? I started in a very entrepreneurial home. Mm -hmm. My Neither parents had a high school education, but my dad ended up teaching engineering for the Navy. So, But we lived in a little small house between my mom's beauty shop, my dad's car lot. We owned orange groves. And I swore I would never be an entrepreneur because we had rental properties that I had to go scrub out the bathrooms between tenants. I was going to become Fun. a professional, right? Mm. And I got my degree in accounting. I was one of the very first women in public accounting in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was hot stuff, boy. <laughs> Young, single, making good money in Atlanta. You know, it was perfect. Had a great time. But I found myself working really long hours. And mm -hmm. so about the ripe old age of 25, I said, this is kind of crazy. All of a sudden, my parents looked a whole lot smarter. And that's when I left public accounting and I started my entrepreneurial journey. Mm -hmm. And I, I really haven't looked back. I started a woman's magazine and sold it. Then I started the, the children's talking book industry, the books that had the sound strips down the side. Back That was back in 1987, wow. before the internet, before kids had electronics. And we said, how can we get parents to trust us? And so we aligned with Disney, Warner Brothers, Sesame Street, Marvel Comics, and allowed us to really explode that company around the world. And I learned so much. There's nothing like actually hands-on business experience. Right. And we sold that company in 1991 and moved here to Arizona. And in 92, our oldest son went off to college in, in September and came home in December in credit card debt. We didn't even know we had credit cards. He got to the campus, and there was a table that said free pizza, free money, another one that said free T-shirt, free money, and um, he had a really good time his first semester in college. Did he buy a lot of pizza with those credit cards? <laughs> what was he buying? Do you know to this day? Have oh, he looked? had a girlfriend in a different town. Oh. So that might explain a few, fill in a few of the blanks. Okay, but, that makes um, sense. But he came home in December and wanted to um, have us bail him out. And we did not. Mm -hmm. we always haven't, always haven't always made the right parenting decisions. But that's when I dedicated the rest of my career to financial literacy, financial education, and entrepreneurship education. Mm -hmm. And today, he's as dedicated to that as I am. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud of him. Fast forward a few years, I met Robert Kiyosaki. He had gone to see my husband, who's an intellectual property attorney, to patent this idea he had for a board game. And Mike introduced us. And I was the only one that got out of the rat race at the first beta test for the cash flow board game. And I loved the idea. It was exactly what I was teaching. The importance of assets, my favorite mm. word, assets. Buying, building, and creating income-producing assets. We're taught in school to chase money. Yep. Exchange your time for money. Mm -hmm. I was raised in an environment, didn't realize that people didn't get this, to buy, build, and create income-producing assets. And that's what creates financial freedom. And so I love the game concept. He wanted to charge $200 for it. I said, maybe you should write a brochure with a philosophy. And that brochure was a little book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. We had no idea it would take off and explode the way it did. And we ended up in over 100 countries, over 50 languages. And that was the first of 15 books that we wrote together. And that was 10 years later, 1997 to 2007. I made the decision to leave Rich Dad. And that's when um, I got the call from President Bush. So I served on the first President's Advisory Council for Financial Literacy. And I share this story, Natalie, because sometimes you have to close one door mm. for other doors to open. And so 
viewers and listeners, sometimes I challenge you, is there a door in your life you need to close so other doors of opportunity will open? How do you think you know that when you're supposed to close one and let another one open? Right here. Mm, In your gut. You keep getting those little taps on the shoulder. For several years, I would get up in the morning and go, is today good for Sharon? Is this staying in this company good for Sharon? No, but are we still making a positive difference? Yes. Uh And then when he really wanted to go into franchising with the company, which was a great plan for us financially, but it wasn't a good plan for the franchisee, that was finally the day where I said, okay, we're not, that's not a good plan. And mm-hmm. I can't stand and support that anymore. It made me pull the trigger to, to leave the company. Were you wishy-washy about it at the time? Or were you like this gut feeling? Is it 100% certainty and confidence that this is no longer the right door? I need to shut this to move to this next thing. The wishy-washiness was the stress of having built this company. Mm-hmm. I was the CEO and the co-founder. We were equal partners, and it was hugely successful. And the brand was very strong, and for me to just step away and walk away from it was a huge decision. But it was I never regretted the decision to to stand in the truth, Mm -hmm. stand in what was good for me, Mm -hmm. and to walk away from a situation that had become not a a good um, situation personally. Our relationship had kind of soured. Because when when you make a lot of money, Uh it just brings out more of who you really are. Mm -hmm. And we had kind of gone in different directions. And at that moment, I know we're going to talk about Exit Rich a little bit Mm -hmm. later, but uh, at that moment, was there confidence that you could exit? Was was that set up in a way that you were very clear as to what this was going to look like and how to structure out of it? Yeah, it should have been very clear, but it wasn't. Um, We were very amicable for the first 60 days, Uh and then the valuation of the company came in. And he was like, no way am I paying you that kind of money. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up in litigation for a year. But we settled Mm -hmm. in October of 2008. And um, it was the right thing. Sometimes you just, you know, a lot of times people don't stand up for their own rights. Mm -hmm. Brandon always tells me people only fight in two occasions, when there's too much money and when there's no money. Like the in-between, the build, there's not a lot of arguments. Yeah, some of the greatest stress is when there's too much money. Success can bring discontent. And that's why I teach people Plan the divorce before you plan the marriage Mm -hmm. because both of you are together. You're excited about the future. You're looking forward. You love each other. You love the concept. You're so excited about what you're going to create together. And that's the time when you say, you know what? In five years, maybe one of us isn't as excited. Let's talk now about how we separate and do it when we are not high emotion because high emotion, low intelligence. Yep. And so do it when you're setting it up so that you can create it. And that's, you know, that's another passion of mine is why I was so excited about writing Exit Rich. The fact that you really have to structure and have that plan for how you're going forward. I just, for those of you who are listening, I just took a pause to take some notes. For those of you who are watching, I hope you are taking notes. I um, I will disconnect. I will continue to disconnect from this conversation in order to write these things down because it's important. Um, I love the high emotion, low intelligence. Um, a little aside on this, uh, I want to get to Think and Grow rich, rich for Women because it's actually set up earlier today. Brandon and I are getting married. We're getting married in October. And we are going through the planning of what that looks mm-hmm. like. And we've actually had our first set of conversations as of this morning mm-hmm. uh, and figuring out like how do you how do you really structure that for what today looks like what mm-hmm. 10 years looks like what 20 years looks like and you want to do it when there is a high level of intelligence and low emotion right because yes, that would exactly. be the inverse right. of that low emotion but you still love each other yes. right in the uh, well you're excited about the future you're excited yes. about what you can build together but you're you're taking a realistic view of where you are today Yep. And certainly, and not this is not just a comment on you, but in today's world, blended families mm-hmm. complicate things. Yes. So it's very important to say, let's put the cards out on the table and right. see, you know, where we are financially, what we've built together, what we've built separately, our children, yes. preparing for ch- making sure you take care of k- children from a prior relationship. Mm-hmm. So those are so complicated. And it's better to do that yes. when you are highly in love. That's good emotion, uh-huh. but it also allows you to do it so that you can really be comfortable with what you're doing together. In this situation, you know, there are kids and all of that, but even when you're growing a business, like how can you actually confront, hey, this team member spends 
a quarter of their time on Facebook and social media, but business owners oftentimes aren't willing to confront difficult situations like that. And the muscle memory, if you just start looking at those things and really have your eye open and your ability to confront things goes up, your confidence actually goes up in other areas, which allows you to be able to create more because you're willing to have hard conversations, make difficult decisions, and really be true to what you believe is fair and your value and what other people should be doing. Right. As it relates to your area of expertise, what you just said is so important. I tell people all the time, when you have the business systems, Mm -hmm. it's so much easier to manage a system than a personality. Yes. So if that person that's spending 25% on Facebook, if you have a job description, an outline, and a code of conduct for Mm -hmm. your company, that code of conduct of how you're going to treat customers, what kind of commitment you're going to have, your time and they're violating something in that, you're po- you're pointing to a system. Yes. Not telling them they're, you know, they're, they're um, less than ideal. Right. So it, it's so, so much easier to manage a business by doing that. Yes. It's the system's fault in a way, mm-hmm. but somebody has to create the system. Mm-hmm. Like at some, at some point, it's either me or it's you, like who, whoever was the originator of whatever that policy or process mm-hmm. look, looked like. Well, somebody created it. It's not like it just existed. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, back to a career path, mm-hmm. and I, we're not even anywhere. We're not even at Think and Grow Rich and Napoleon. So let's let's get back to that. Sure. Well, as I as I said, when I left Rich Dad, I did, really didn't know what was in front of me because I thought Rich Dad was my legacy. Mm-hmm. I wrote fifteen books there. That's like giving birth fifteen times, and I really <laughs> thought that was my legacy. But somebody upstairs had a little bit more for me to do. So when I had the honor of being working with President Bush and President Obama on the first President's Advisory Council for Financial Literacy. That's when we passed the Credit Card Act of 2009. So it kind of comes full circle because that act prevents credit cards companies from soliciting children on college campus. Incredible. And for within, I think, a thousand feet of college activities. And so it was really important to me to see that happen. I can't really take credit for the bill, but I was a very squeaky wheel. Yes. And so that was like... Yes, yes. We've Thank got. God he went and got pizza and a free T-shirt <laughs> because this is now passed. It's, it yeah. became real for you. So kids that are graduating now don't have that same issue. Now, they mm-hmm. still get solicitations for credit cards, mm-hmm. but now they have to show that they can repay. They have a source of income or they have a co-signer. Okay. And so it really has helped elevate that from the standpoint of using your brain and had that that pause before you sign on the dotted line. It's less predatory. So it's really important. Yes, yeah. And so about that same time, we're now in 2008, we know what's happened to the economy. Mm -hmm. I got the phone call from the Napoleon Hill Foundation, which was hugely exciting to me. I read Think and Grow Rich when I was 19. And I knew Don Green, who's the CEO of the Napoleon Hill Foundation, because my husband and I had both helped him with some of his international work. But he reached out to me and said, Sharon, with what's happening in the economy, we really need to revitalize Napoleon Hill's teachings. Mm -hmm. And that's when he asked me to step into a project called Three Feet from Gold with Greg Reed. And that's how I met Brandon, because yes. Brandon read Three Feet from Gold. But that was the first book that I did with the foundation. Followed up the month we released that was when I got the call about Outwitting the Devil, which was a manuscript that was hidden away for 73 years. And what an incredible honor it was to bring that out, because mm. it was like I'm co authoring it in essence with Napoleon Hill. And when we released that book, became the idea for Thinking Grow Rich for Women, because I was actually kind of getting frustrated. Mm -hmm. I've been around a long time. Mm -hmm. I started one of the very first women in public accounting, and I was frustrated with women complaining and criticizing all the time, complaining about the men that stood in their way Mm. or the men that weren't helping them and just always. And what do you get when you criticize and complain? If you believe in the law of attraction, right, you're attracting negative results. Mm -hmm. So I said, let's change the dialogue ladies, mm-hmm. you know, this is my broadcast message to all women, mm-hmm. stop the complaining. Yes. Let's stop complaining and criticizing and start celebrating the progress that we've made as women. Mm-hmm. Is there more progress to be made? Yes, of, of course. course. But let's celebrate where how far we've come and mm-hmm. let's celebrate the men that have been fantastic along the way. And what do you think will attract. Mm -hmm. We'll get more positive results more quickly if we come through a a mindset of celebration and contribution. And that was really the power behind writing Thinking Courage for Women, because the original book was written at a time when women weren't in business. Right. 
And so to have the honor to come out and say, all right, let's look at these same 13 steps to success, Mm -hmm. but let's look at them through the eyes of successful women Mm -hmm. and then talk about how I've applied those in my own professional life and then have quotes from women of history, women in politics, women in network marketing uh, uh, for each of those elements. And it was such a great fun, fun project. Over 300 women that I have outlined in the book. Mm -hmm. And it really, as a reader, a woman reading it, you might read a story and say, I couldn't do that. But the next one you say, wow, I could do that. And that's the whole goal behind it was to give women support. They're not alone. Mm -hmm. And that when you feel like you've had something happen that was negative, someone else has had that too. Mm -hmm. So let's get past it. Because women, we tend to, do, we have a mistake or, and we define ourselves. Yes. And I go, a mistake is not a definition. It's an occurrence. Learn from it. Yep. That's one of the things where we're a little, men tend to say, oh, that happened next. Yep. We tend to like hang on to it. Really hang on. And let it, <laughs> let it define you. Let it like create, it's a chapter in your life, but it turns into the story of your life. I didn't know that uh, you, you are so kind and sweet and the book having read the book the whole piece of it like all of it comes together from my standpoint as what you just said the the women examples and being able to really put that in front of women but it's I like to know I like the gritty side of you on the front end of that statement where you said that this was to kind of show women that you don't have to have excuses like that you don't need any more excuses if people, if one person's been able to overcome X obstacle and created Y, y result, it gets rid of your ability to use that same thing. Mm-hmm. Because I originally thought that the book just was, because you're just benevolent. And sometimes I feel like I'm just like, I'm a little sassy. And it's great that you're sassy in that way too. I just didn't pick that up originally. I am definitely been called sassy and a I few other it. things <laughs> as well. <laughs> What did you you um the 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 godmother the what when we were over at the house a couple of weeks ago that was there was a a title for you adult supervision I think is what we were talking about adult supervision <laughs> yes you just you're very I, I like that there's that grittier yeah I think it's a combination of grit and grace mm. right and understand all of us have had things that stopped us in our tracks mm. it could have been a financial setback it could have been a death a divorce, could have been an illness, but we're still here. Mm. So you're still here for a reason. And so my message to people is whatever you went through, you survived. Mm. And so today you have the ability to help others going through that and actually have a responsibility because as humans, we're here to support each other, right? And you want to be able to add value to other people's lives each and every day. And it's okay to challenge people. I mean, that sassiness that you have, part of it is is pushing people out of their comfort zone. Mm-hmm. That's what Brandon's very good at that too, mm-hmm. right? You, in order for us to expand, we need to do new things. We need to remain curious and mm-hmm. creative. And I, I ask people all the time, when was the last time you did something for the first time? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> need to write that one down. I'm going to start asking people that. So this week I was in New Mexico, so I went to a pistachio farm. I saw a pistachio tree for the first time. That's a first. What does it look like? Um, It's interesting. It's an actual tree with these little red and green berries on it. I I had no idea. Show my ignorance. I did not know pistachios grew on trees, but now I do. (laughs) And I didn't know that either. Yeah. Was, we're I on went the same to, boat on that. <laughs> I went to the White Sands in New Mexico, which is amazing, a very spiritual place. So again, always challenge yourself to do something new. Take a moment to do something you haven't done before. Mm-hmm. And it helps create that creativity, curiosity. And it actually triggers your entrepreneurial spirit. Mm-hmm. I love that. All right. So we are at Think and Grow Rich for Women. Mm-hmm. You wrote this out of a need, out of the communications that you were having and the opportunity to shift the story from a male-dominated book to, okay, how does this, how is this relevant from a woman's standpoint? And I think it's, Nat, I think it's very important for people to understand that I love men. Mm -hmm. I love working with men. 
And it's when women and men come together, we get the greatest results. Mm. And I think that's really important for, for women to understand that we add value. We, we, our steps to success are the same, but we tend to approach them very differently. And I always get somebody saying they don't agree with me. But as a general proposition, men tend to be more decisive. Mm -hmm. They're very strategic. Mm -hmm. Women, we're better problem solvers, which means we can often fall prey to analysis paralysis. University of Pennsylvania did a study, and it showed men tend to hang out on one side of their brain or the other, right? We as women go all over the place when they brain map because we're problem solvers and we're always looking at it from the creative side, the practical side. But sometimes we get into this, you know, back and forth and won't make a decision. Yeah. And so when we can bring that talent of analyzing to the, a man's talent of being strategic and decisive, you have the best of both worlds and you have the greatest outcome. And that was the other reason I wanted to write the book and show that, you know, let's not, it's not women instead of men. Mm -hmm. It's women and men. Mm -hmm. And the stats show that when you add women to boards, you the company will have a better ROI. They'll have more income because you have that extra talent and insight. We tend to be more intuitive. And all of those are strengths. Mm -hmm. And so you get that one plus one's 11, not two. Mm -hmm. so. uh, I just wrote down the steps to success are the same. I know it's the whole principle of the book. It's the exact same, but just in a different perspective. Mm -hmm. But you really start to think that the steps to success look different because of what you just explained with women's strengths versus mm -hmm. men's strengths. So there's a different path. But the path is still the same. It's just how you are navigating those exact same pillars. How do you, how do you utilize your strengths mm -hmm. to accomplish what you want? Mm -hmm. Recognizing your weakness and then finding somebody to add to your team that is strong where you are weak, yep. male or female. And then you get the greatest results. It's fantastic. That came out. What year did that did Think and Grow Rich for Women come out? Oh my goodness, you're challenging me. I think 2015. All right. 2014. 2014. <laughs> I I have my secret weapon over your shoulder. She is amazing. <laughs> she is. Angela is incredible. incredible. <laughs> so 2014. <laughs> and since 2014, what is the the impetus for this next? chapter or next book, I guess you could say, for uh, Exit Rich. Well, there's been things between Think and Grow Rich for Women. Right. And I did Success and Something Greater, again, okay. with Greg Reed, my co-author, Three Feet from Gold. That came out after Think and Grow Rich for Women. And then now Exit Rich is number 26. It's been Incredible. around a long time. 26. But, and the reason I did Exit Rich is I have a friend who's a mentor to Michelle Seller Tucker, who's my co-author. Mm -hmm. And she, ha she has the largest um, female-owned business brokerage in the country and she's a mergers and acquisitions specialist mm -hmm. so she has sold and helped companies buy thousands of businesses so she has an incredible knowledge depth of knowledge and so the book has her tactical very this is what you do mm -hmm. and my part the six p's yes the you six guys p's. have to read the six p's the six p's are important you need yes. to get the book and read the six p's oh, i can even do a real high level oh. discussion about the six p's but my participation was really to go in depth because we don't agree on everything, which and we share that in the book, mm -hmm. but is to sh look at it from a mentor's perspective and as a, an investor. Mm -hmm. This book is a great tool for somebody who wants to invest in a company. You look at that company through the eyes of the six Ps, yep. and it helps you analyze how strong their structure is, how strong their viability is, how strong their intellectual property is, mm -hmm. and the six Ps. You want me to run through them? I would love that. I think, don't you guys want this? I know you guys want this. <laughs> so the six Ps start with people. Do you have the right people on your team? Do you have people who are strong where you are weak? Do you have the right mentor? Do you have the advisors who help you? Because that power of association is so important. And then beyond people, you have your product. What are you buying? What are you selling? Are you, is it a hard product or is it a service product and then processes business systems my right? favorite word that's what creates a scalable business processes business systems and what happens is most people try to do everything on their own mm -hmm. and they don't take the time to build those systems so I compare a viable business to a house you have to go down first and you have to put in plumbing 
electric so that 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 house will be standing and strong. Same thing in a business. You need to create those systems that will allow you to take your successful business, Mm -hmm. make it sustainable, scalable, and saleable. Yep. And so processes are very important. Business systems are really important. Systems is kind of like my second or third most favorite word. Assets, royalties, leverage, systems. Systems number four. Okay. I like that. (laughs) Four very important. You guys are, I hope you're taking notes as fast as I am because this is um, a lot happening at one time. People, product, process. And then proprietary. Proprietary. That's your intellectual property. That's that intangible value that's not book value. Mm -hmm. It's what they call goodwill when you sell a company. And that has to do with your competitive advantage. It has to do with your goodwill, the the reputation. Mm -hmm. And of course, the intrinsic value of your logo, your, your look and feel. But it's also how what sets you apart, what, what gives you a unique selling proposition, and what have you created that no one else has. Mm. And so that proprietary um, information is your intellectual property, and we want to help you identify it, protect it, and leverage it. Mm. And that what it really gives you incredible valuation. Forty years ago, Fortune 500 companies were 85% bricks and mortar, 15% mm. Intangible assets. Mm-hmm. Today it's flipped. Wow. Less, in fact, it's closer to 87, 88 percent, and Fortune 500 is intangible with a very small percent bricks and mortar. And so it helps us level the playing field because that allows us to compete better yeah. when we're competing with knowledge, uh-huh. not buildings. Right. And so it's such an exciting time for us in so business. So empowering because yeah. you don't have to be able to have the capital to purchase a building or to go into that. Like your 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 ability to read a book, your ability yeah. to learn skills and create something yeah, is think, what's think valuable. Airbnb, one of the top hospitality, they own no hotels. Yeah, Air, you know, Uber, one of the top transportation companies, they own no cars. Yep. So that's it's all intangible and in the goodwill that they've built. Mm-hmm. And then the fifth P is patrons, and that's your your database. And today, one of the huge biggest mistakes people are making mm. are the the benefit is through marketing, they're getting these huge reach, mm-hmm. lead generation through Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, and probably a few more that I'm too old to remember. You got them all that I use. <laughs> <laughs> but so you've got these huge um, lead generations uh-huh. and people stop there. But you don't own those names. Mm-hmm. You can get turned off. Mm-hmm. You're not in control of that. Mm-hmm. So you want to entice them. You want to invite them home. And get them to come to your database through giving a free gift, um, through connections. Mm -hmm. And what happens is when you send a message on Facebook, who controls whether they get it? Facebook. Facebook. Your ability to spend money on ads so that you can get visibility. Yes. But when you have a database Mm -hmm. and you send a message, they all get it now. Whether they open it or not, that's part of your marketing as well. But you have the ability to communicate with them. And many businesses sell based on the value of the database. Mm. A competitor wants to buy you not because of how you do your business, but they want your customers. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to build your database. And then the sixth P is profit. Now, most people only focus on product and profit, which is why they'll never be able to sell. Yep. Because they're not focusing on building the processes. Mm -hmm. They're not focusing on the proprietary or on the patrons. Mm -hmm. And it's hugely important. If you want a true business, if you want to own a business, not own a job, Mm -hmm. you will build a business based on the six Ps. Mm -hmm. And that's taking your successful business, making it through systems, Mm -hmm. sustainable, scalable, and saleable. It's incredible. Do you find that when you have worked with people that anybody is good at all six of those things? Like I'm just thinking with even, you know, our own business, there are people who are great at certain aspects of it. And one entrepreneur has to determine, well, I I want your perspective. Do you determine which pieces that you are going to be responsible for? Do you have to learn all of them in order to be great? How would you advise people? That takes you right back to P number one, people. Mm -hmm. What business is a team sport. Mm-hmm. You have to have the right people on your team. And believe me, I don't want to be responsible for learning how to do digital marketing. Right. That would not be a good plan. No. 
right? I want 20 year olds to do mm-hmm. that. Yes. So as an entrepreneur, sometimes we have to get out of our own way. Mm-hmm. We have to bring in the talent and the expertise with people that are strong where you are weak. Mm-hmm. And so no one, you're, you're never going to have a true business if you try to do everything yourself. Mm-hmm. There's this dichotomy between b- business owners who get really stuck, especially in early phases where they're entrepreneurs and doing everything. Um, but then all of a sudden they start hiring other entities to fully run um, the proprietary piece or to fully run their um, their month-end closing. And that they take no responsibility at some point. So how to train people to say, you still need to learn these things. Nobody was born. You weren't born with all of this knowledge. You had to learn it and take some level of responsibility. It might not be 20% across all six of those things, but you have to understand 80% of one of them, maybe the people side, 5% of processes, but make sure that the people are in place for the other 95% and really have some expertise in all of those areas. That's your responsibility as a business owner. Absolutely. As a CEO or a business owner, you're responsible for the whole network. Mm -hmm. So part of those business systems that you build, the, you know, the proprietary piece, as well as the process piece is that communication tool. So you want to be focused on driving your business forward. Instead of working in the business, you want to be working on the business. Mm -hmm. But you need to have a reporting tool or a dashboard so that you do have your pulse on everything that's happening in the company because Mm -hmm. ultimately you're responsible. And so if you want to really grow, you want to make sure all all cylinders are firing. Mm -hmm. And you do that by making sure you have the right people in the right seats and the ones that have that talent to take you to the next level. And what I find in a lot of companies is they have people who got who helped them and got them to this point, mm-hmm. but they're afraid to let them go or reposition them, but they need people with higher and more specific talents to get to the next level. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a huge transition for a lot of business owners. Yeah. And what are like the clients that we work with? You actually just gave me a great idea around like what is the dashboard that they should be looking at? We have services and different things that they can utilize to help take some of those pieces off of their plate. But at some level, this this baseline, this foundation of their own understanding of how business works and why, most importantly, they need to be building it with an exit in mind has to be at the forefront of their knowledge as they grow as a business owner. Right. And a lot of times I know what you got, you do this with a lot of your clients is establishing those KPIs. Well, those KPIs should come together in an overall management dashboard Mm -hmm. that everybody participates in. So you have a way of measuring whether your forward velocity is going in the direction you want it to. Mm -hmm. Why now with Exit Rich, is there any advice that you can give people or the listeners around why it's important to be thinking of this concept today in 2021? Well, when you first go into business, you should be thinking about your exit plan Mm. unless you want to have a job the rest of your life. Mm. And so my passion behind writing Exit Rich with Michelle was the fact that I have all kinds of programs that my husband and I developed that help people build strong businesses. We do one-on-one mentoring, right? But there's only so much of me to go around and our programs are online so people can access it. But we also wanted to take it and just kind of give a guidebook. Mm-hmm. You know, Steve Forbes says Exit Rich is a goldmine for entrepreneurs because it really does give you, it, it triggers those thoughts of areas that you might need to pay attention to. One or two things that you might do that can increase your, your business valuation 10x, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it's how do you figure that out? Well, here is the, here is from the experts. Between mm-hmm. Michelle and I, we have more years of experience than I'm willing to admit. <laughs> but lots of companies that we've we've built, we've sold, we've bought, and we've taken all of that experience and put it in there with stories about companies that have done it right. Sometimes, more importantly, about the mistakes people have made along the way, mm-hmm. but always with the intent of finding that business owner to truly own a business, not a job. When you first started sharing the early part of your story when you were 25, you talked about hours. And I, I'm curious to know when you were working originally before you left and decided to become an entrepreneur, did you find once now that you've been an entrepreneur for 
however many years you've been one, uh, that you've worked more hours or less hours than you did originally? Well, that's really a complicated question mm -hmm. because I own my life now. Mm -hmm. Nobody controls me but me. And so if I want to take a month off, I can. I just happen to love what I do. So I still work a lot of hours, mm -hmm. but I'm in control of my own destiny. And that's so important to me. And what happens when I have somebody start kind of restricting me? You know, I'm a terrible employee. <laughs> so, But it's... It's the joy of what I do that gives me the excitement of keep going. So, yeah, I could I could stop what I'm doing today, mm -hmm. but I get joy and pleasure out of helping people find put themselves in a position of greatest potential and finding those elements that can take their business. Because at the end of the day, your business is there to serve people. Mm -hmm. So if you can have help from what, something that I've written or part of the 10X program that can help you serve more people, then you're you're creating a better gift to society. Mm. So I like that. I find that there are people who give advice once they've become successful that hard work and hours, like the whole point is to be able to not have to work long hours. And in in the situation with with you and, and what we've talked about, you choose to work long hours still. You can choose not to, and that's the freedom that you've created, but it's not as if you started a business to work less hours. You've worked more hours than you would have if you likely would have stayed in that Well, I have job. noticed in the past few months, I'm starting to kind of get a little paranoid about it. Uh -huh. The past <laughs> few months, I've had like a dozen people ask me, well, why do you still do what you do? It's like, do I look like I should be out in the pasture or something? <laughs> but it, it's, it's pretty funny because I do love what I do, yeah. and, it's, and I do it because of that, yes. not because I need it, not because I need the money. But because I believe I have wisdom yes. and counsel, not just advice, but counsel to help people create a greater and faster success. Because today, speed to market is so important. And a mentor helps you get around the bad stuff. He prevents you from hauling, falling into the holes that they did. Mm -hmm. And not only, they can open new doors. Mm -hmm. They open up, using an old term I know, Rolodex. Open up their contacts, their associations to help you get to the right place more quickly. And that's... That I love that. I love, you know, I had a client right before I came here today. He says, I want to be your best student. Mm. And, you know, he said, what do I need to do? Mm. And I loved Angela was there. She said, just do what you say you're going to do. Mm. He might need to fight Brandon off for that title <laughs> because I think Brandon is like, I'm going to be Sharon's best student. But that really is the true testament to the work that you have spent your whole life creating. And now you have the responsibility that you've created success, you continue to do that, but you're not letting yourself off the hook that it was all just about you and the creation of what you have. It's the, you're responsible to all of us, to the people listening to this, to just mankind in 2021, to be able to continue to move this legacy and this information forward so that they don't do the same things that you did. Like it's, I would think that that's a weight at some point. Like it's, oh my gosh, I know these things. I can't just sit on a beach for six months because at some level that's not I don't, selfish yeah. if you've done that but you know like it's, it's I, don't, I don't do idle very well I can't imagine that you do I because don't. you have this responsibility <laughs> I don't know if that's it or not or if I'm just crazy but yeah I, I don't I, think you're I, crazy. I, don't, I don't do idle very well but you know I was raised by a father that asked me each night Sharon have you added value to someone's life mm. today so he's been gone for 15 years but mm. I still ask myself that and so it's what can we do to assist others moving in the right direction and it's something that I feel a responsibility to continue sharing as well as long as what I have to say matters. So, Well, it certainly does. Thank you so much for being on the Work Woman podcast. Pick up her book. It is on Amazon Exit Rich and you can also find not just Exit Rich but everything that Sharon works on through SharonLector.com. I appreciate you so much for the impact that you've made on me and on Brandon and so many others. And I look forward to what we create together and supporting each other. So thank you.